We're in a short series, four-week series called Radical Jesus, and we're hoping to make a bit of a statement with this series, honestly, a bit of a punch in the face. No, just kidding. Uh, last Sunday was our grand opening, so we assumed that we would have some guests and uh, checking out our church, and so our desire as a preaching team is to present Jesus the way the scriptures present him, and uh, particularly not hiding some of the more easily hidden elements that you might uh, be able to skirt by. I was recently um, spending some time in, on mission in India, and so, so you guys that have been here with us have heard this story, but I'm reminded, just as I'm preaching and preparing this message, uh, how much undoing the misconceptions of Jesus is really an American thing. Um, you know, I, when I was in India sharing the gospel with villagers that had never heard before, I didn't have to open up with, um, how have you seen Jesus portrayed on South Park and Family Guy? Now, that wasn't something they struggle with, or there was no need to ask if they have heard of the classical liberal views of Jesus, that he's a good moral teacher. There's no need to ask, who is Jesus to you? As if Jesus is a blank slate that we get to define on our own terms. And yet in our culture, this is exactly what we must do. Everyone feels entitled to define him in their own terms, and often these terms are the ones that are most comforting to us. Uh, I once worked at a Sam's Club many dark days ago. Um, a young lady I was working with on a project in aisle 34, uh, we got to the conversation of spiritual things. That's why I tried to work there, instead of make that happen. And so I asked her about her views of Jesus. She said that Jesus, to her, was love and light and accepting of all people. Now, when I heard that, you know, I could have made that work. You can make that work. John, 1 John says God is love. John 8 says Jesus is the light of the world. And in John 6, where it will be today, it says whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. I could have made that work. But, you know me. I like to ruin things. And so I had to ruin the moment and ask, well, what do you mean by that? After much decoding, I found that light and love to her meant a spiritual force that warms you and makes you feel loved. Not a person, not a savior. I found that accepting to her meant that Jesus would never address a person's sin. In fact, he would never make a correction of any kind in your life. Her view of Jesus was not exactly radical. In fact, hers was one that was made up in her own mind. And might I just throw in for free that if the Jesus you worship never contradicts or conflicts with any of your views, it's likely that you worship a Jesus you have made up in your own mind. You see, Jesus said and did some hard things. As a church, and we, we want to show you these things, not hide them. Uh, this church values the Word of God as it is written. And one of the ministry patterns that Jesus employed, it can be found in every gospel, is that he would perform this huge miracle or sign, a crowd would gather, and then he would say something outrageous that thinned out the crowd and revealed who the true believers were. This is a routine pattern. And this is exactly the pattern that I want to show you today in our radical text. So turn with me to the Gospel of John. If you have a Bible, if you don't, there should be a little green and white one near you. Feel free to read that or take that with you for free. We'll also have them on the screens for you. John 6, we'll probably start around 53. This book was written by one of Jesus' best friends and disciples named John, who was an eyewitness to the events recorded here. And what we're about to read comes from the conclusion of a sermon that Jesus preached in Capernaum at the height of his popularity. So as I skim through four Gospels looking for a statement that I could brand as radical, this is the one that I read it and said, that's probably the most shocking single statement. And it, maybe not the deepest like last week, Joe shared on daily picking up your cross and denying yourself. That's probably on a deeper level, more radical. But this one is complete surface level radical. Like you hear it and you're just like, wow. So um, I like to live on the surface. So without much context, let's look at what Jesus said in John 6, 53, and we'll go through 59. God's word says, so Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. 
Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. Well, that's a tough one. Uh, what in the world is he talking about? Eating people and stuff. What is happening? So, so one of the secondary things that I want to accomplish in this message is I want to free you up as a church body to be able to read a passage and say, man, that's weird stuff. You know what I mean? A lot of times we think we can't say those kind of things, or that's outrageous. Uh, you are free to say that, and you should say that. And so, a lot of times, 9 out of 10 times, if you read a little before and a little after, it'll clear up your issue, but it's okay to question things that you read. Speaking of walking away, let's look at what Jesus' disciples did after they heard him say this. I want to fast forward now to verse 60. What did Jesus' disciples say? Well, Verse 60 says, when many of his disciples heard it, that is what I just read, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? So they're being honest. In verse 66, if you go forward there, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. My purpose today is very simple. I want to diagnose this story and apply it to us. In my outline, it's not an acrostic, it's not alliterated. I know you expect that from me, but it is simply the three questions that I asked when I was trying to interpret this passage. That's all it is, the three questions. Why did they walk away from Jesus? What did Jesus mean by eating his flesh and drinking his blood? And how is this statement radical then and now? So first, we'll go right into it. Why did they walk away from Jesus? If you're reading this, you should wonder that very thing. Most of us are familiar with the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. So if you're not, just know Jesus took a young boy's lunch of five loaves and bread, uh, two fish, miraculously multiplied it to feed a huge crowd of 5,000 people, likely more. This miracle is actually one of the few ones in every single gospel, so you know it was very important. Um, and so if you look back, so I'm, I'm covering like 70 verses today. Just know that. So I'm going to just be throwing you all over the place, and you can just trust me that I will not rip out of context. But normally I don't do this, but this whole story spans 70 verses. So if you go back to uh, verse 14 and 15 of chapter 6, you'll see where I'm coming now. Verse 14 and 15 tells us that after this miracle, the people were so amazed, so excited so certain that they had found their messianic king after seeing the, the bread be multiplied. They were ready to make Jesus king right then and there and go take down the Romans right now. You see, the Jews had been under Roman rule for a while and they were ready for their long-awaited prophet king to come and destroy Rome to ensure that their bellies were full, that the weather was always nice, and that all their needs were met. They had followed Jesus for a while and when they saw him multiply this bread, they thought, hmm, that's a pretty useful tactic to be able to make bread. So Jesus, when he, we heard this, he kind of did the old Irish exit, the old uh, three-step and drop back, get out of the crowd, disappear into the trees. So it says that he just kind of disappeared into the mountain, and everyone didn't know where he was. Um, so the next day comes, and his disciples actually went ahead of him on the water. And the story goes that Jesus walked out there on the water to him. Now that I read this chapter, I think he might have been hiding from the crowd, and that's why he actually walked on water, but that's just me talking. Um, so they make it across. All the, all the other people begin to come across. So the people wake up that morning. They realize, hey, the bread man's gone. And so they get in their boats, and they start going across the sea to look for Jesus. They're looking for breakfast. Verse 26 tells us their motives. Jesus finds them, they find Jesus, and he says to them, basically, I know why you're looking for me. I'm the bread maker to you, aren't I? You're looking for a piece of toast and a cup of tea now, aren't you? They were looking for a free meal again. Now after this, Jesus launches into an amazing sermon on bread that these people were seeking. 
And it really got me thinking about the context in which we live. And I see a lot of similarities between this crowd following Jesus around and our modern consumer culture, especially in Christian circles. You see, Jesus wanted to make absolutely clear in this sermon that he followed up with that everyone understood there is a difference between seeking the goodies that God provides and seeking God himself. Jesus wanted to be crystal clear to these consumer followers that he did not come to this earth to give us bread that would satisfy us for the moment, but rather he came to be the bread that would satisfy us for eternity. You see where this train's headed. There are many in this world that would take the trade, that exchange the presence of Jesus in our lives for the blessings of the presence of Jesus in our lives. And we don't want to be a people that make Jesus out to be a means to an end, a necessary rung in the ladder to get us what we want in life. This is why the prosperity gospel preached by Joel Osteen and T.D. Jakes and Creflo Dollar and Benny Hinn and many other false teachers is particularly disturbing because they look more like the bread chasers in John 6 than they chase the bread of life from John 6. Our great city, which I love, which I hope that I have the privilege of living for a long time, is very confused about what it means to follow Jesus. The people of Fort Collins have so wrapped themselves up in the American dream that even our version of Christianity in this city looks more like a buffet line than what Jesus called us to do. And I hope that the churches here are not competing for the fickle followers promising the best bread. The success of a church has nothing to do with its budget or how many programs they can offer your children or the design of the stage and not primarily if you are feeling fed but rather its faithfulness to the word of God and its execution of the mission of God. Don't be fickle, consumeristic, bread-chasing Christians. And why? Because this text tells us, number one, you might miss out on the presence of Jesus, and two, you will walk away at some point in the future. This crowd was Jesus' biggest fan when he was doing miracles because they had a use for that. They deemed him useful in their lives. And they were willing to cross the Sea of Galilee just to find Jesus somewhere on the other side. And I'm afraid if we lived in that time period, I'm afraid I would have been excited about seeing those boats come across the sea. They're looking for Jesus. No, they just wanted freebies. I have optional put by in a bracket by this. I'm going to say it. <laughs> Just so you know, that's how I manuscripts my stuff. I don't know if I want to say this. All right. You might look at last week's grand opening and hear how excited we were to have such a great crowd. Our biggest ever. The crowd that wanted a reigning Roman slayer, but he poured himself out for the ones that would follow a suffering savior. Now, why did this crowd walk away? Because Jesus did not meet their expectations. I want you to think about your life. First of all, are you engaging with Jesus on a personal, spiritual level at all? Because you have to ask that first. Are you desiring to get to know him and to live for him? And secondly, if you are, what would you do if Jesus told you I'm not going to give you those things that you expect me to give you anymore. You'll have your food and your clothing and your shelter, but beyond that, I will only promise you my presence and my strength to endure the challenges that you will face. I will not remove you from hardships, but I will be with you. Would that Jesus be enough? What if you took a massive pay cut? What if you had a, a medical episode? What if all your friends gossiped and turned their back on you? The Jews wanted a Jesus that would feed them and be their political king. Well, Jesus wouldn't play ball, so they left. Now, you may not be a first century Jew, but I would imagine you have something in your life that you are counting on Jesus to hold up on his end of the bargain, on a bargain that you have only made. Now, what if he says, no, I'm not going to be that. I'm not going to give you that. Now, the tactic that the, the Jews in this story use reminds me of what my students, particularly my eighth graders, do in my classroom. 
In verse 31, they say, come on, Jesus. Our ancestors got manna. At least they got manna in the wilderness from Moses. You owe us something. Prove yourself to us. You know that's the mark of a false disciple? You better dance, God. You better do what I tell you, almighty creator. You owe me this. You can almost hear God's voice from heaven say, Who are you, O man, to answer back to God? The potter has every right over the clay. And we would do well to avoid the mistakes of this crowd and come to Jesus like the leper did in Luke 5, who fell on his face and begged, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. So hear me today. Jesus is all about showering blessings on his children. All about it. He will meet a physical need because he is compassionate and merciful. But when you're using Jesus or his church to get your needs met, you will miss out on the presence of God and you are a ticking time bomb to leave and move down the church buffet line to find your next victim. When Jesus mentioned eating his flesh and drinking his blood, this crowd knew the jig was up, their freebies had ended, and Jesus was getting all spiritual on them. And there wasn't going to be a Moses manna shower part two. And so they left. And now we're ready for the second question to be answered. What did Jesus mean by eating his flesh and drinking his blood? So I hope that this is so crystal clear to you that I could call you up this afternoon and say, explain this to me. And you could just perfectly line for line. So that's what I'm hoping out of this moment. Um, so as we examine this text, really verse 53 through 57 we have a few interpretational, hermeneutical options. I love that word. You know I do. Um, so here's, here's the possible ways that you can interpret this passage. And I'll be really brief on this stuff because it's only fun for me. Um, number one, Jesus endorses cannibalism. All right? That's your option if you want to believe that. Um, but did Jesus really expect that we polish off some fava beans and a nice key ante? I think not. Um, I almost made the sound and I didn't. In fact, this was a misunderstanding that the Roman Empire had against the early Christians. So, if you were to live in the first century, the Roman Empire actually thought early Christians were cannibals because of these kind of phrasings. This is also terribly misinterpreted by the Roman Catholic Church as one of their reasons for a view they call transubstantiation, meaning that they believe that the communion or the mass literally becomes the flesh and blood of Jesus. And so every Mass, Jesus is re-sacrificed. That's what a Mass is. And so we don't hold that view. Um, there is no evidence whatsoever to support that this was a literal statement from Jesus. We should hope that it's not, actually. Um, number two option, Jesus is describing communion. He's talking about uh, a future institution of the ordinance of communion. And so, um, that's a legitimate option. I know I've read commentators that believe that, but the problem with that view is that he says, if you eat of this bread, you will live forever. So if Jesus was describing communion, he would be saying that communion can give a person eternal life, which would go against everything his entire mission and message said. So I like number three, which I could have just given you from the beginning, but this is more fun. Number three Jesus simply connects the bread metaphor of the manna in the wilderness to himself to show that he is the greater manna, the bread of life, that should be eaten. Okay? You guys follow that? Are we good? So I want to explain that. This is the view that I'm going to be showing you. Uh, so let's read now. Go back to John 6, 30 through 36. John 6, 30 says, So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen and you do not believe. And so now here's the tie-in. Let's fast forward to verse 48. This is the flesh tie-in. Verse 48, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness, and they died. Didn't work. 
This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. Here's the catch. Here's the tie. And the bread that I will give you for the life of the world is my flesh. Okay. So we have our metaphor. Bread is flesh. That's the metaphor. Okay. So it's probably helpful to know a little bit about manna. What day. They could collect one portion per day and two on the Sabbath. No more. So the Jews in Jesus' day, having just seen a miracle, just seen Jesus break and multiply bread, ask Jesus to do another sign for them like Moses did with the manna. And in this moment, Jesus knew he had an analogy that he could preach. See, Jesus was a good preacher. The sermon is Jesus expounding the understanding that his life is a better, more beautiful, more powerful picture of the manna in the wilderness. And Jesus says, you want bread from heaven? I am the bread from heaven. I came from there. I came from heaven. That's, that's where I lived before I was born. And I will sustain you, but not just for one day like the manna did, for eternity. Now, this is the, the first of seven I am statements in the book of John. If you ever read through the book, there are seven big statements like I am the good shepherd. I am the vine. I am the door. Uh, there's a list of seven. So this is the first one. And it's important to know what Jesus is saying here when he says I am. Because it's not just it's not just saying that's me. When Moses stood on the mountain with God. In, in chapter 3 of Exodus, he said, who shall I say sent me? Moses asked that to God. Who, what's your name, God? We've been using Elohim, or we've been using Adonai, but what's, what's your name? And so God says, tell them that I am sent you. And so when Jesus makes these statements, he is using the exact phrasing of the covenant name of Yahweh and calling himself that and so he knew exactly what he was doing. Now, I want to make doubly sure that you follow the connection from bread to flesh in the sermon, because that's where the radical statement comes in. So here's the summary. Crowd gets miraculously fed by Jesus. Crowd wants to make Jesus king. Jesus says no. Crowd follows Jesus across the sea. Jesus calls out the crowd for their shallow motives. Crowd asks Jesus for a sign like Moses gave with the manna. Jesus says there is a better manna available, and it's him, the bread of life. Jesus says you must eat of the bread of life to live. The crowd doesn't understand, so Jesus clearly states that his flesh is the bread. So that's how you get from beginning of story to this crazy statement, okay? So Jesus says you must eat of his flesh. In context, it's actually a brilliant metaphor to use. He answers their question about manna. He shows that he is the greater manna, and he reveals their unbelief, all in one metaphor. It's actually very brilliant, which he's God, so should be. Um, and just to be clear, so after all this is said and done, this is not a literal statement. Are we, are we good with that? I just want to make sure nobody goes home and say, Mr. Jared said you have to eat Jesus to live. No. Temper that with a metaphor. Okay, so... Jesus is using the manna metaphor for uniting with him by faith. When he talks about eating his flesh, the metaphor about the manna and the bread was supplied by the crowd. So he didn't even come up with this metaphor. They pushed the manna thing, and he made it into the bread of life. He, he used their analogy. He's basically saying, I am the bread. Here I am. Come and eat of this bread. And now, you might think that this would end the discussion. But there's an even a, a deeper element that Jesus was sharing because you have the eating the flesh thing that I feel like we dealt with well. But you still got the drinking the blood thing that's left over. A person that would partake of the everlasting bread must do so through blood. Now, in other words, Jesus looked around at these large crowds and he knew that most of them did not want to follow a king whose kingdom was not of this world. And whose crown could be achieved by means of a cross. Now, you would see... Uh, that the blood Jesus mentioned here was to signify of the kind of death that he would die. If you wanted this bread, you, if you wanted eternal life that would satisfy you, you would have to do so on the terms of a king that bled and died, a God who sacrificed. 
the concept that they would have to put all their eggs in the basket of a guy who kept saying he was going to die was very unsettling to this group of flaky followers. And I think even today, on this side of the resurrection, I think the cross is still a stumbling block to many. I often hear things called the gospel proclaimed, yet with no mention of the cross or the blood. Last week, I know I heard it. I know Joe preached that in order to follow Jesus, you must take up your cross and die. Now, the real reason, I got to thinking about this. Why, why is the cross hated? Why is the cross a stumbling block? You see, the world is an enemy of the cross, not because they don't like the idea of sacrifice. We do. Our culture rightly celebrates military heroes, first responder heroes. We understand the value of giving your life for someone else, and many even see the virtue in the death that Jesus died. So that's not the issue. No one says, I don't see that as a virtuous act. It's the reason why that he was sent to the cross that is the subject of both avoidance and of anger. Jesus was not simply the moral example of love that we all needed to see. It's not the sacrifice that we struggle with. It's the substitution that we struggle with. It's the idea that I should have been on that cross. It's the idea that Jesus went there because I sinned against God. It's the idea that Jesus didn't go to the cross and make payment of a perfect life in exchange for my sin. I would be lost, hopeless, and helpless, and I would stand before God in complete judgment if not for Jesus. You see, verse 53 is so radical to the ears of our culture today. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. And now we've actually arrived at the radical part. The radical part is not actually the flesh and the blood part in our culture today. You want to know why this message is radical to our intelligent, progressive, educated culture? It's not because of the eating flesh and blood. To a first century Jew, that was their problem. They, the idea of drinking blood to them was just crazy, and so they would have cut it off at that moment. But a 21st century American has enough literary training to understand a metaphor, I think, and to read backwards and find the context of the statement. What makes this so radical to our culture's ears is that little word in verse 53, unless. Unless. Now you might want to circle that word in your Bible and in the margin write John 14, 6. Now what I have found in this culture is that the most radical thing a person can do is to make a claim of exclusivity. To have the gall, the pride, the bigoted mindset that there is only one way to have eternal life and it's in the death and resurrection of Jesus alone. And Jesus said, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. That means you can't have life without Jesus. That means that every other attempt to find or manufacture life will fail. That means that there is one path to know God and to enjoy him forever. And that path is through Jesus. And it's not the Jesus we make up in our heads. The Jesus that came down out of heaven on a rescue mission to take the place of sinners on a cross. Because we needed saving. And our best efforts to, under, uh, to save ourselves would not cut it. John 14, 6 testifies to us even today. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is no second way. All paths don't lead to the top. I promise you God would not have sacrificed his beloved eternal son for finite sinners if it was just to be one of ten ways to be saved. Salvation must flow through the flesh and blood of Jesus, and there is salvation in no one else. And we must take it and internalize it and accept it and revel in it and apply it to our lives. We must ingest this concept of Jesus as our satisfying, sustaining Savior. And to use Jesus' own metaphor, 
we must eat and drink this concept until the gospel is a part of who we are. Amen. When the large crowd of disciples following Jesus heard this, verse 60 reports that they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? And verse 66 reports that many of Jesus' disciples turned back and no longer walked with Jesus anymore. There's a very intensely personal moment in verse 67 that in this message has become one of my favorite verses now. <coughs> the crowd was down from 5,000 to 12. After the big crowd leaves, the dust settles. <coughs> Jesus is sitting there with his 12 original disciples. And Jesus looks up at them and says, Do you want to go away as well? Do you guys want to leave too? Because I would understand it if you did. Now, I don't know how much awkward silence passed or how many glances darted around the circle to the twelve. But Peter, who sometimes spoke a little too soon, got it right this time. He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Where else am I going to go? You have the words. Sure, it's hard to understand. It's hard to take. But where else am I going to go? You have the words of eternal life. You have the truth. Where else could I go when you have the truth? Now listen, maybe you sit here today and the gospel is hard for you to take. Maybe it confuses you, maybe it outrages you, but I hope that after considering the weight of the big questions in your life, you realize that Jesus has the words of truth and there is nowhere else to go except to him. And I hope that you will consider coming to Jesus today. He is the true bread that comes down from heaven. No one that comes to him will be turned away. And if you believe in him today, you can have eternal life. It's easy to get caught in this trap of being just like the crowd. Wanting Jesus as long as he gave you bread. The good news is that Jesus is offering himself the bread of life. And my invitation to you today is to come, take, and eat. In a moment, we're going to sing a song and the band will come back. A pastor will be available to pray with you in the back if you would like to respond in the moment. If you want to make a decision to follow Jesus and be followed up with, please write that on your connection card. That would make us so happy to follow up with you. Please indicate that in your card. You can turn it into the offering time. And whatever Jesus says to do in this time, you do it. Let's pray.